Uh, we are here for lecture by Lev Manovich, and after that we'll have panel discussion. So uh, the exhibition, the aggre aggregate I, 13 cities and 12,694 people to 2,035,3017 Instagram photos. Um, three people collaborated this project, Lev Manovich and Nadav Hochman and Jay Cho. Uh, Lev Manovich is world-renowned innovator in digital humanities and theoretical theorist of digital culture and media arts. His global reputation in digital humanities stems from the tremendous impact of his 2001 book, The Language of a New Media, which I'm using actually as a textbook for my new media course, uh, has been translated into nine languages uh, today. today. Uh, his most recent book, which was published over the summer, um, is titled Software Takes Command, published uh, by Bloomberry Academic. He's a professor of a computer science at the Graduate Center, City University of New York, and director of a software studies initiative. Manovich's art project have been presented at ICA, Central Pompidou, and the Walker Art Center, Chelsea Art Museum, and San Diego Museum of Contemporary Arts and Gwangju Design Biennial and Graphic Design Museum. So welcome, Lev Manovich. Uh, Do I need to use this? You guys can, you can hear me, no? That's yeah. because of the recording, recording. <laughs> okay, so, you know, um, so, so I'm not, go so, you know, I didn't have time to actually prepare, I was going to prepare this lecture uh, and talk about representation of a city in a kind of photography and film in the 19th, 20th century, even use it as a context for our work. Uh, but I think what I'll do instead, I think it'll be more useful to you, is I will actually uh, show you exa uh, examples of uh, many other projects we have been doing in my lab since 2007. Uh, so, so I'll place this particular project in the context of our explorations. We have been doing uh, using large image and video collections and uh, visualization techniques such as the ones used here. But before I start, uh, let me introduce Nadav Hochman. So Nadav is a, yeah, so Nadav, so I, I, I think Nadav will be like the next kind of, right, the next uh, generation of super brilliant scholars. Uh, so he's the one who initiated the project, and mostly what I've done is just enabled this to happen uh, using kind of the grants which I had. Uh, so maybe I'll just say a few words about, uh, yeah, we can't go online, so, uh, so we can go to the website, yeah, sorry, but. Uh, uh, so, uh, so you started this, when did you start working on this? On Instagram? Yeah, about two years ago. Yeah, so Nadav started working with this two years ago, just by himself. Uh, uh, and then um, eventually he set up a way to download uh, images and the accompanying data such as, you know, usernames, uh, dates, uh, descriptions, tags from Instagram. I mean, millions of companies are doing it, so we're not doing anything special, except what we're doing special is using this for cultural research, as opposed to building some commercial products. So over the course of a few months, he was able to download 2.3 million uh, Instagram photographs from 13 global cities, including New York, uh, uh, you know, Tel Aviv, Paris, uh, and so on. Uh, and then uh, we started working together on uh, experimenting with interesting ways to visualize this huge image collection. And the idea was not to start with some preconceived idea, what we may find, and not to immediately div divide this collection through some conventional categories, such as demographics, but to actually be able to look right, at 2.3 million images and to see what's where. So to be able to observe this immense cultural landscape and see like what the people photograph, uh, our particular subject which are more prominent, our particular photographic conventions, 
uh, which we see more often, but we only now are beginning to work on this more particular questions. But I think as a first iteration of a project, as a first kind of layer, which is what you see exhibited here, the idea was uh, to visualize these photographs as a kind of collective, as a kind of collective like aggregated, oh thank you so much, collective aggregated kind of portraits, right, of 13 global cities. Right? And I think that, thank you so much, and I think that from this point of view, right, it is uh, possible, right, so this is, See. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Awesome. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So this is a. So the project actually exists on the website, uh, which has more visualizations. But just to finish what I was saying, uh, so I think that this particular exhibition, right, presents a particular take, right, a particular angle, uh, a particular way to think about this massive image collection of this massive image sample from vernacular digitally enabled, software enabled uh, photography. All right. uh, and to think about this not necessarily in terms of individual differences, and maybe looking at the photographs by different people, but rather to aggregate them, right, to combine them into this collective aggregated uh, kind of portraits right, of the cities, and also representations of this collective social activity. So this is a website uh, for a project which we released in July. Uh, so you'll find kind of other you know, visualizations beside the ones you know, which are shown here. Uh, so this is, so here are three visualizations from a gallery, right, San Francisco, Tokyo, New York. Uh, so I'll show you just some examples of some other ones. Okay. So this web page uh, presents some of the key techniques which we developed to visualize this collection. Right. So one technique is we call this radio plots. Right. And you see a few examples upstairs. So in this case, we take you know, a big image collection and we create a plot using the software which we wrote. So it's custom software where images are sorted, right, in a kind of radial way, right, where one attribute controls how far each image is to the center, and the second attribute controls the angle, right. So, for example, right, so to go back to what you have actually uh, upstairs in the gallery, okay, so here we have Bangkok. So this is 50,000 Instagram photographs from Bangkok from um, 2012, right? And they sorted by average brightness, so the computer measures average brightness of each photo. It this determines the distance of a photo to the center, so we go from very dark, right, to medium to very light. In the second attribute, which computer measures, is the average hue, which is the average, right, kind of color uh, of each photo, if you think about colors forming a circle, so where this photo is. And when I first kind of, you know, and when I first tried this idea of average hue, was actually something which my my undergraduate student did, and I thought this is such a strange idea. What does it mean to talk about average color of a photograph? Photograph has lots of colors, but actually it works out quite well, right? So uh, we have a kind of workflow, a process where the computer measures all the photographs and outputs the results, and then we have a separate program which we wrote which creates these visualizations. Uh, so I, if you're interested, I suggest that you spend some time uh, on the website because you can actually zoom into these visualizations and see more details, okay? So here it is, right? So you can see the things are a little bit larger. Okay, let me fix your computer a little bit here, okay, so. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, it's better, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. It'll be better after after <laughs> yeah after I fix it. Yeah. So you see kind of more details, right? But of course, the advantage of a sprint from exhibition is that you can you can step out and you can see the larger patterns. So then you can step in 
in C more details, right? So in this case, you can see in the case of these visualizations, the size definitely matters, right? The size definitely matters, right? And the, but is the reason. So if you know something about the kind of history of, for example, warfare, for many centuries, like war generals would use kind of m miniature models for battlefields, and then we would kind of plan the battle, right? So, so was the reason why we didn't just use drawings, why we used the actual models. So there was something about the fact that you can have a large representation, and you can see details, but you can also see the whole thing. And this is something, unfortunately, the web, right? The web sort of doesn't allow us. Uh, so, uh, and I would say, you know, as a kind of footnote, I would say that the web has obviously been an amazing cultural force and enabled all kinds of creativity, but I think it also stifled creativity because people are so used dealing with limitations of the computer screen that you have a s small resolution and now dealing with mobile screen that nobody ever thought about doing these visualizations. So the reason I thought about kind of doing these visualizations in 2005 is that I was exposed to different kind of research where people are cre created like very large screens the size of a wall made from multiple computer monitors and this is what gave me the idea of doing these visualizations, right? So the size actually is very, very important. Anyway, so, um, so here are some examples of these visualizations from above. Okay. Uh, so this is this radial visualization, so you have uh, three examples upstairs, but we can also visualize data differently. So here, for example, we have uh, uh, about 33,000 photographs, which were shared in Tel Aviv over one week, and we organized by hue, right? So the hue is the distance from the center, and then the angle is the upload date. So this is one week, right? So this is one week, and uh, actually, okay, actually there's a way to make it, okay, we way to make it smaller. So it's one week, and maybe there's no way, okay, something happened to the menu here, right? I discovered. Uh, so it's one week, and you can see how, in fact, most days are the same, but this is a very important day in uh, Israeli society. It's a, uh, I forgot, it's a, it's a memorial, right, memorial day, and where different things happen, people go outside, there's national, national kind of, you know, sirens, there are fireworks, and you can see how the events of this day result in different patterns, but most other days are very similar, so there's a kind of visual routines of individuals uh, which are reflected in this temporal radio plot. Uh, now, you can also do other things. Sorry, let me try to go back. Please. Yes, which one was it? Okay, sorry, just a minute. Just a good move. Okay. Okay, sorry guys. Okay, I will tell you in a second as long as I kind of something happened to this. Uh, yeah, something happens to, I think, the website or just need to try to redo that. Oh, I see. Here, what is this? PowerPoint. Okay, I don't know. It's Do you think PowerPoint? Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Here we go. Um, yes, actually, not that. This is common though, because this no, because I think this would be. Yeah, but. Yeah. Yeah. So you you put this. You put this. You tell it. Yeah. Yeah. So in this project, we mainly. Um, examine the data based on uh, visual attributes, so view, contrast, line orientation, things like that. Uh, so very uh, top level, I would say, visual uh, elements of the images as opposed to content, and we just wanted to see how uh, these, uh, uh, when you aggregate all these images, how these unfolds from, from different places, and how, what are the differences between different places around the world. Um, and what we found is some of the results of what you see in this, in this gallery. And, uh, and you actually see very significant differences between, di between different places. And that was kind of surprising because if anyone, any one of you is using uh, Instagram, uh, 
uh, knows that you know the images all look pretty much the same. Uh, you know, people use the same filters. People that the the structure of the image is uh, is always the same. Is 612 pixels by 612 pixels, uh, and the content is usually the same. So, the the question that was interested uh, that we were interested in was to visualize to actually visualize to find differences between different places, uh, and that's what these radial visualizations show at the end. Uh, so the the way that uh, these images unfold differently from different places actually shows you how these places are different. And when you zoom in, you can see these differences in terms of fashion, in terms of architecture, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of colors of food, right? Um, and then you can, you know, the next step of the project will actually be to, you know, uh, uh, zoom in even further and actually visualize the content itself. Uh, but that's, all of these questions are cultural questions. I mean, how many pictures are taken in New York at specific point in time versus the same time in Tokyo? Uh, and why? Um, in which places? These are all cultural, social cultural questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe I can also offer a few illustrations. So, so these two images are actually ones, right? You see upstairs uh, on the right wall, but we, we can combine and we, we rotate at 90 degrees. So this is a few days in New York, and this is kind of a few days in Tokyo. It's actually the same number of photographs. Uh, so in Tokyo, you can see how the same number of photographs, right, gives you more days because people like uh, they're uploading at this point less pho photographs on Instagram. But this is more about Instagram use than the kind of social reality of the cities. But I think what's interesting is that you can see in both cases how day becomes night. But I would say that these patterns of day night seems to be more pronounced in Tokyo than in New York. Because I think in New York you have lots of tourists. So these patterns are not necessarily like your kind of industrial society workday, which day, leisure, night, but with tourists, right, we kind of walk around, we do all kinds of stuff, and you actually, if you zoom into this and you can look at this on the gallery, you see lots of images of skies. There's people actually outside taking photographs, right? And you can also see how each day is a little bit different, which is kind of surprising to me, right? So the time becomes compressed and the time becomes expanded, and then if you go look at where Tokyo, you can see how its boundaries, right, between day and night are kind of more pronounced. And I think this is because you know, people work and we go eat. And I guess, you know, we eat in traditional places. So this kind of, this kind of, uh, I don't know, waves, right, of eating, it's all kind of the same, I guess, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, not, not, it's not sushi because it's expensive, right? I think it's soups and uh, other things. So you have this, you see these kind of differences. But I think the question which is very interesting and very subtle, can we separate, with di can we think, because we can think of Instagram as a certain social mirror, right? As a certain window into the social differences. But we can also say that with, with differences which we the differences which we're seeing are the differences how people use Instagram. So are we actually studying a world through Instagram or are we studying Instagram itself, right? So is Instagram a message or is Instagram a medium? And I think, you know, and I think this is, you know, a very interesting question, which kind of brings this into the whole realm of media theory, media history, because you can see, this, you can ask the same question of any media. I mean, analog photography, film, television, newspapers, right? So the stories which you, re the stories which you read in newspapers, is this actually something happened in the world? Of course not. This is the stories which are created by journalists to follow the genre of, you know, particular of, of narrative of narrative in newspaper, right? So we can say with all modern cultural mediums are not transparent. They tell you something about the world out there, but they also tell you about conventions of the medium. So Instagram is an hour one. Right? And then I'll just show you maybe one more thing. Uh, so as Nadav said, this is the first iteration of a project where we're kind of interested in this global aggregated patterns, but we also started to play with patterns of level individuals. So I've done this visualization, which is so this is a so on the left you have something which is very very conventional in the sense that you see lots of this project today online. So this is uh, I think all the all locations of all photographs uploaded to Instagram in Tel Aviv over three months. You know, and what you see is that you kind of see certain contours right of Tel Aviv, so the squares and the main streets light it up more because more images uploaded with. 
right? So this is another way to kind of aggregate this activity, right? So you get this map out of people patterns of using Instagram. But then we also have something like this, right? Where here, because Instagram gives us this data, right? So you, know, you basically get username for each photograph. Now this is not people's real names, this is whatever you used as a username when you signed up. So we give this visualization, okay? Where it consists from you know, a few hundred graphs. And does it say what it is here or it doesn't say? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, where each graph, so each graph is like a scatter plot, where again we plot locations of which person photographs, which the person uploaded to Instagram over three months. So most people, so this is the beginning of 2012, not so many people using Instagram. So this is actually 300 most active users because most people just had like one or two images. So this is real locations. So that's why all the graphs are similar in very colorized. Uh, so, so green, I think photographs taking in the morning, kind of orange are photographs taking in the afternoon, and red are photographs taking during the, during the evening. And you can see how each individual, right, is a little bit different, right? And then we also have these lines so if person shared two photographs within 10 minutes, we connect them by lines. And what you see here, right, like for example, this person, right, this person, some people, right, most of activity is concentrated in downtown. And this person travels or, you know, navigates throughout the whole Tel Aviv, right? And this person, let me see if we can, this person only active in the morning. This person mostly active like in the evening, right? So each person is different. Now, if I was a consumer company, right, if I was advertiser, my goal would be maybe to aggregate these patterns and say, here's one cluster of people. They have one type of activity. I'm going to show one ads. I'm not interested in this. What I'm actually interested in is explore the kind of diversity, right, of people's behavior, right? So, so, uh, so the idea is to kind of show this variability, right, variability of people, how in fact each person is a little bit different even though we can definitely find clusters of similarity. So this is the example of what we can do on a more individual level. Uh, uh, and I can kind of go on, but this is some examples, right? The patterns, again, mostly we can focusing on, uh, and let me show you one thing, mostly focusing on this kind of level of citywide activity. Now we also published like a very long paper which goes into details. And let me show you something from this paper Maybe a different graph, which we didn't put here. Okay, here we go. So it's a intern it's a intern it's a very respected uh, journal, uh, which is open access journal about internet studies. So there's a paper. Uh, let me show you some interesting thing here. Yeah. So this is basically, for example, this one is uh, st simply statistics of uh, the images which uh, Nadav downloaded, right? So this is number of, so he was trying to download the images within kind of the same period, right? Approximately three months, but he was using a single computer, so it's not exactly accurate. Uh, so, and again, this is beginning of 2012, when Instagram wasn't as popular as it is now. So, so during this time, more and people were using Instagram, right? So number of users goes up. So we can see how, of course, in San Francisco, during the same time, people uploaded more photographs. And when Tokyo was still uploaded uh, you know, a lot, but a little bit less, right? And then in this, and of course, it's also, I mean, in Rio, which is also a very large city, people only uploaded 64,000 because, again, people were not as onto Instagram in Rio uh, you know, as we are now. And then we basically also look at some very simple statistics, for example, you know, like how many, how many, how many users during this period uploaded more than 30 photographs, right? So what we find, for example, in Moscow, in so Tel Aviv turned out to be the most active city. So over 10, over 10 percent of people uploaded more than 30 photographs. So we don't have as many users, but the users are very like dedicated, right? Whereas in New York, everybody is so busy, right? New York has uh, only two percent, right? <laughs> right. So New York. And then we also have some other statistics. And let me show you one more graph, right? Uh, so this is, you already, we already discussed this. Okay, this one is interesting, right? So what this one shows you, 
right? So uh, not this one. Yeah, sorry, this one. So when we download uh, when we download these images, right, from in from Instagram, the Instagram also records which filter you apply to the image, right? So when we look at the statistics about which filters people use, and this is the graph. So uh, you have a so. Um, Let's see, how does it work? So this is 16 different filters which were available on Instagram at the time. And then, uh, and then each, each different color, right? Each different color is a different city. And you can see how the patterns are exactly the same, right? So this is kind of shocking, right? So what we found is that people use these filters in almost exactly the same proportion. Now, you can say, but no, so did we actually look at how this is related to the kind of placement of filters on the interface? I mean, does it, it doesn't completely correlate to which filters appear first and second, right? There's a connection, but not a, not a clear connection. Yeah. All of it, yeah? So now you really begin to wonder why do people in different cities, which have very different kind of uh, visual sensibilities and different kind of characteristics, why do people use these filters in the same way, right? So here's an interesting cultural pattern. Okay, she, she left, right? <laughs> okay, let me just get to more features, right? So you discover, and then finally, let me show you one more thing, right? Okay, so what we've done, right, is that we take those photographs, and then we, uh, you know, when we kind of take a computer program, which we wrote, and we run all these photographs of this computer program, and the program does, it basically, you know, measures some characteristics and gives us a spreadsheet these characteristics, right? So for example, for each photo, we get things like average brightness, or how much in red, how much green, how much blue, right? So you get like different different, you know, different kind of visual attributes, but they represent as numbers, right? So we got about 60 numbers for each photograph. So then based on these numbers, we can create this other type of graph, right? Which shows you how different or how similar all the cities, right? So this is, the diff this is the kind of positions of the cities, right? Like these dimensions don't mean anything, it's just simply two-dimensional map, right? Based on visual properties of photographs people shared in the cities. Now, just to show you that, of course, each of this graph, right? You know, there is not one absolute graph. Depending on what you put in, you'll get different results, right? This is one graph, that's the second graph, because we use, for example, here we only use color, color features, and here we also use texture. But in general, we're a little bit similar, right? So you can see Bangkok is the most unique, right, both here and here. In effect, what we can see is on the one side of this graph is Asian cities. So maybe the colors are a little bit different, and the texture is a little bit different, right? So Bangkok, Singapore, and Tokyo, right? Uh, but then here, right, we get more of a kind of mess, and you can also see how depending, right, on which attributes you use, the graphs are a little bit different, but what you also find is surprises. You find, for example, that New York and Tel Aviv in Sydney are very much close together. Not something I would imagine, right? So in terms of these visual attributes of these photographs, New York, Tel Aviv, and Sydney are very similar, and so is Rio de Janeiro in London, which is kind of strange because they're such different cities, right? Right, but here we have a little bit of a different mapping. Right? So this is another kind of analysis you can do, right? You can actually look at the kind of similarities or differences between the cities based on, you know, fi based on hundreds of thousands of photographs people upload. Uh, so I think this is exactly, I think, the time where my lecture ends. And uh, I think the panel is supposed to start. Uh, but is there something I should show? Is this, this is like enough, right? This is like enough, I think. Um, Okay, maybe I'll just show you one more thing and then I'll shut up. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, I was also going to show you like a few examples, I'll do it very briefly, of uh, other projects we've been doing in my lab, even before like Nadav joined us, you know, so we're not simply looking at photographs. So I'll just show you a couple of things very briefly. Uh, so, for example, uh, so here we look at one million manga pages, right? And uh, this, is, this is how visualization looks. So it's, this is one million pages. And I also told you that I, I was inspired to do this work because we had access to this fantastic displays. So this is a display, uh, it's not exclusive to our lab, it's kind of, it's basically shared by different labs and research institutes. 
at the campus of University of California, San Diego, where our lab is located. So here we're looking at visualization, right? And of course, it's a little bit better than what you get in the exhibition because you can actually zoom in and pan and see all the details, okay? So just to totally kind of impress you, impress the hell out of you, I will actually show you uh, how these things look at a larger scale. And also, I want to, the last thing I want to tell you is with all these visualizations in the show, you can actually download them from Flickr at a larger size and make your own trees, right? So if you want to put something in your, in your bathroom, you know, some wallpaper, you know, you can get this. So let me just kind of show you how it looks. And that's, I think, the very end. Uh, okay, let me see. Okay. Yeah, so our Flickr account, I think it's called CultureVis. CultureVis, all right? And then if you look at the sets, so here's the, so here's all visualizations, including the ones in this exhibition, all right? So if you like this one and you want to make a print, all right, you can just kind of go here and, sorry, we changed a bit the interface, so it's a little bit hard to use. So here it is. You go to all sizes and you can go, sorry, this is only 8,000 by 8,000 pixels, right? But it's still, it's still kind of, you'll still see more details than you'll see upstairs. All right. So here it is. All right. Okay, and then you can just go download it and you would get like, you would get the whole image, okay? So it's all, it's all free. Uh, so, uh, so I was going to show you just one more, which is this uh, example of how this technique can be also used with sort of our, uh, our uh, data sets, uh, let me see, just a moment. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, just see what this, okay. Uh, hmm. Sorry, I don't know, uh, just one second. You know, Flickr changed the interface, so it's kind of impossible to find anything now. Yeah, so this is this is so this is all the images which we had in our exhibition, actually almost three years ago. And again, you can download all the images at different size. But uh, so this one is, for example, this is all the covers of Time magazine from 1923 until 2009, simply organized by time. So you see all these different kind of patterns over time. No. And again, the original image is also quite large. Okay. Okay. So notice we haven't done anything special, right? Any manipulations. We simply got this image set and just displayed it over time. And because these images are similar, we can have the same size, we have similar structure, you actually start seeing interesting patterns in content and also communication, who is in the cover, you know, visual compositions, colors, and so on. And finally, uh, I guess this is a people's kind of pleaser. Uh, so this is one million monkey pages, also sorted by some visual characteristics. Uh, so this is the largest we rendered so far, but hopefully we'll beat this record next year. Um, so the original is actually 30,000 by 30,000 pixels, but we couldn't get it in Flickr. So what you get is only 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. Uh, and again, the images are sorted by st stylistic differences. So here you have lots of texture, lots of detail. Here the images are much more kind of black and white and uh, not as much detail. Okay, and this is the kind of original. So you see all this stuff here. So here's individual monkey pages. And of course, they overlap a lot. So don't really get to see one million, you just see like the top layer, right? Yeah. Okay, so you guys, uh, I think it's your time. Thank you. Yeah. Let me give a formal introduction of uh, Nadav Hoffman. He's a doctor, student in the history of art and architecture at the uni University of Pittsburgh. And he is a visiting scholar at the Software Studies Initiatives at the Graduate Center CUNY. His research focuses on the use of a computational methods for analysis of a massive online visual cultural data sets. 
He holds a master's degree from the, the University of Pittsburgh and the interdisciplinary program of the arts at Tel Aviv University. Uh, Nadav was a visiting researcher at the Museum of Modern Art and is an Andrew Mellon Research Fellow. And Alice Titten Tiffen Pale. Did I pronounce your name? <laughs> Tiffen Pale. She is a doctoral student in art history at the Graduate Center City University of New York. She is an art historian, editor, writer. She's a very accomplished novelist, and her novel has been translated to other languages as, as well. She's a curator whose interests include the history of photography as an art and new media aesthetics. In 1996, Tiffen Tiffen co-founded the eLab, now called RIXC, the first new media arts activist group in Riga, Latvia. She co-curated Latvian Pavilion at the fifth 55th Venice Biennale this year. It is still on, right? Until when? 24th. <laughs> Alice is the author of the Photograph as an Art in Latvia, 1960 to 1969, published in 2011. So welcome um, those panelists. Me? Um, okay, I am the director of Amelie A. Wallace Gallery, and I'm also co-curator of this exhibition, more of the organizer with the Alice. Um, I also teach here full-time uh, as a lecturer. I teach history photography and also new media arts. We actually use Lev's uh, language of a new media as a textbook. And uh, so it's really an honor to have you here uh <laughs> and have this exhibition at Wallace Gallery. So, uh, well, I started using Instagram quite recently. I didn't use it until this uh, summer. Um <laughs> <laughs> and I was really interested in uh, just uh, listening to your lecture, uh, interested in how similar um, those individuals who live in different cities have similar preference for certain uh, filters. Because it's not like uh, we discussed which filter is a popular. Because uh, when I use the filters, it's a kind of a, it's for fun, you know. I choose what's attractive, what's exciting, what's most uh, effective visually. And somehow our decision making when it comes to which filter to use uh, seem to have a common factors. So I'm really um, uh, surprised by that result of your research. I think, I think w one thing I just want to say, right, and Nadav can, can correct me if I'm wrong. So, um, so my first idea when, right, when we kind of when we look at this statistics was, well, you know, when you actually look, if you look, if you use Instagram app, right, on your phone, uh, so we can't fit all the filters on one screen, right? So you get like first like four filters or so, and then you get another four. So I thought, well, probably with order, probably with, probably with proportions which we found. 100% correspond to the order of filters in the app. Well, unfortunately, you know, we, we didn't have a way to completely test it because during the period when we were collecting the data, when Nadab was collecting the data, which is spring of 2012, right, we actually changed. Like first of all, we had, we had one application for Android, one for iPhone, we're not exactly the same. And also during this time, we, I think, retired some filters, we did some filters. So maybe different people so different interfaces, and I guess what you found, right, is that so 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 the interface itself changed during this period, right? But I guess what you find is that, and also when I look at this recently, what I saw is that there is some connection between the proportions of filters and the order in which we appear in the program, but not 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 exactly, right? So maybe there is some filter which is in the middle, but it's used a lot. And Nadav, do you have any fervor? Uh, kind of, did you? gave some further thought to, because this is, I think, very interesting, right? 
Uh, it's kind of what's interesting. It's kind of subtle. It's unexpected, right? Yeah. I, I well, the only explanation that I have that I have is that you know people have very specific visual preferences, uh, and these vi visual preferences seem to be similar in all all of the places that we checked. So, because uh, each filter has a very specific visual appearance, right? Uh, so people. Yeah. Yeah. So this everyone seemed to prefer the same filter. That's that's uh, that's what we found. I I don't know how to explain it. Yeah. Maybe now that you know. Filters? Yeah, yeah, we do, yeah. yeah. Hi, good morning. I have to use the um, um, No, I was just thinking that um, you are, th Nadav, uh, Nadav's contribution to the exhibition is uh, also part of his uh, doctoral dissertation in progress, right? And it's uh, in art history. Uh, so I was just uh, uh, wanted to ask maybe some, some uh, um, couple of questions that would be like, uh, I would play a devil's advocate and ask something that uh, kind of a hardcore old school art historian would ask. But um, it's, yeah, 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 you, you have to. <laughs> but it's like interesting that these, uh, um, that is that uh, you told me a little bit when we were discussing uh, one of the works that uh, uh, usually like one particular work. So it's like a singular work uh, also in history of photography, you are looking at one particular piece. And here it's um, in your project, it's uh, is there like, I don't know, uh, important shift because there is n the one single singular image kind of means nothing. It's just uh, one of, as you said, uh, when there are 10,000 or 100,000 images, then it makes sense. But uh, how then you would uh, apply any, uh, I don't know, methodologies from art history to that? Um, because I, I don't think that there re really exists um, art history that would use or that could be applicable directly to that, uh, to the data set, because you are not talking about singular images, but about data sets. Good question. Uh, I would say that the, the, the art historical quest questions are relevant. The methods, not so much. So while we can keep using the same traditional questions and develop new questions, we need to develop new methods. Uh, and with this kind of cultural production, what you have is like, as I told you, you have like uh, more of the same thing pretty much. So you have you know, a series of cliches, right? photographic cliches that people, that people uh, uh, take. Uh, and the question is, what can you say about these cliches? What, what is the best way to, to learn them, to study them? Um, and I mean, for example, uh, as Lev showed before, we, uh, we started from this very uh, uh, top level comparison of 13 different cities, and then we zoomed in into, this, into one city, into Tel Aviv, du du during uh, exceptional dates in the city. So during Memorial Day and Independence Day. And what we were looking for is to see how the significance of these days are projected or manifested uh, in picture taking habits in the city. And we found many different you know, uh, interesting patterns, uh, socio-cultural patterns. Uh, um, for example, uh, during Memorial Day Eve uh, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, there are two uh, uh, central memorial events in the city. One is uh, left, uh, wing, le very leftist, uh, and one is, one is very right wing, right -wing uh, uh, political event. Um, and what we found is that while in the uh, national event, the right wing event, many, many people took pictures in, in, in a, during this event in the, uh, in the oppositional uh, memorial event, uh, the leftist one, uh, almost no one took pictures during, uh, in, this, uh, in the area. Uh, and the question is why, right? And these questions, you know, uh, this brings up uh, a new question that we couldn't have thought about before. Uh, so, I mean, 
that's one example of what kind of question you can ask. I mean, how does this relate to art history? I mean, um, you want to ask? Yeah, sure. I will come back to the second question, but can I, can I try? Can I try to answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think I, I kind of have a one answer. So I think if we look think about any humanities discipline, right? History of art, history of music, li studies of literature, studies of film, studies of popular culture, architecture, right? So people do, right, people make two kinds of statements. So you talk about particular individuals and particular artifacts. You talk about particular novel, particular painting, particular building, particular TV show, right? And this is what humanities thinks is very, is very kind of uniqueness that in contrast to science, which only deals with general things, we deal with unique human expressions. And then at the same time, right, just as people do in sciences, or similar to how people do in science and in humanities, people also make statements about the general. So typically it's a statements about conventions or patterns. For example, people say, okay, still life in, in the 19th century, or representation of a city in 20th century photography, right? Or, you know, people would say, what is the typical narrative of a classical Hollywood cinema from 1940s, right? So, so if you can, if you agree with me for a second that this is maybe two main, right, two main kind of modalities, two main directions of humanity discourse, you can say, what does this kind of methods have to offer? Well, I think that, I think it's very easy to connect what we're doing to the second thing, right? But the difference is that normally, if you're going to make some statement about, okay, typical subject matter of, I know, 20th century painting or representation of a city in, you know, er interwar photography or something else, you can make the statements based on your intuitions or based on your observation of limited number of artifacts. So now we can observe using computers, right, much larger number of artifacts. So maybe our statement will be more precise. And also we can maybe see like more fine differences, right? We can say, okay, this is how people represented, this is how people photographed portraits in 20th century. And uh, in fact, we can chart a whole distribution of, for example, the size, the difference between, sorry, the, the, we can, let's say we can measure, right? The size of head in a photo for all the photographs in all the museums and actually look at the distribution. So we can also look at patterns and conventions in a way we couldn't before, because it's not just this is represented frequently, but how frequently, and also how it's something represented, right? So, so this is one answer. The second answer is you can say, what does this method have to do with study of individual people, individual artworks? Uh, well, so this is a little bit more tricky because you can say, well, you know, we can use these computational methods and find some very unusual, some very special photographs on Instagram and then write about them. And this is what I always say, except I never do it, right? Because it becomes so fascinating and so interesting to look at patterns across millions of images, you don't really care about individual images so much. But at least this is the premise, right? Uh, so there are more answers, but this is maybe two possible answers. I just had this thought. Um, first of all, the users of Instagram app are, I mean, I use this occasionally. Sometimes I use more than other times, but I wonder just as much as like a Twitter or Facebook, those are social media, um, you know, often used by younger people rather than let's say older people. So whether these results represents youth culture, um, um, whether there is any kind of a factor of the age, um, you know, uh, have to do with the presented, the visual, uh, visualization data. Uh, completely separate thought that I just had was um, whether the, the weather effects of each city might influence the hues and these are color, um, you know, visual uh, factors, elements that you end up getting. So these are two 
you know, comments or thoughts or whatever? What do you think? Well, I will just say about the first thing very briefly. So, you know, so, okay, so in America, there's this very big nonprofit organization. Well, I don't know, nonprofits. Now you begin to wonder who pays for all these nonprofits, but anyway. Uh, you know, <laughs> okay, called Pew, Pew Internet Research Center, and we study kind of how people use social media, internet, mobile phones, and you can go to our website. You know, it's a massive organization. We do kind of surveys, and we publish this every few months. So you can actually find out demographics of people who use Twitter, internet, and how it changed over time. And and so uh, so I would say, but I also we also spend time using some existing kind of tools. We like pay tools, but we got like test account, which allows us, for example, to go into any area on the map, world map, and just to look at Instagram photographs. So you can very quickly observe. So based on both objective data and my own subjective observations, I think if you look at like industrialized countries or more developed countries, in particularly big cities, like all the cities in our sample, it's not just young people. It's basically kind of everybody, okay? But when if you start going to some smaller countries, and also places which are maybe not as modernized, like Middle East countries. Like I went, for example, look at some like countries in, you know, in a, in a kind of a former Soviet rep former Soviet Asian republics, like you know, all the stands, you know, Tajikistan. Yeah, you kind of see like all these young people, not just girls like showing very kind of you know very miniscules, but also boys showing very muscles. So you do get the idea, and then also the images are much smaller, right? Some so you get the idea that maybe in the more industrialized countries and bigger cities, the demographics is very wide, but maybe in, in the smaller places, or in the places which are further away from the kind of globalized modernity, uh, with demographics is more limited. Nadav, you have something in relation to the second question about Weber? I, will, I, can just gi I just answer easy question. No, I mean the, f the, f the first question. It's it's right. You with each d with every data data set that you examine, you'll have biases, uh, and the question of biases is uh, is very relevant, especially in social media data. Um, and as Lev said, the proportions of users and demographics of users changes from each city, mm -hmm. and we don't have this uh, yet. Well, I mean, we do like with the two internet, right? You have yeah, but we have it only from the United yeah, States. Like yeah. Yeah, so you have to, yes, yeah, so we have to pay very close attention to the biases, but I think that w the, um, uh, the results of our research are about Instagram usage, so not about, you know, outside of Instagram. We can, we're saying something about Instagram, right, about differences of images within Instagram uh, um, for now. Uh, so I have to, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, that's these biases are built in within every data set that you'll examine. Um, and as to the second question, I mean, yeah, of course, uh, whether affects picture taking habits, the way, you know, uh, the visual appearance of images or objects in the images. Uh, so they affect the result, but that's part of the differences between these different places, right? Uh, so weather, culture, and many other things. Um, so yeah. question, but it's, it's probably also not so much about, uh, not, not this time about, yeah, it is about art history anyway. Um, I was um, just about that discussion about demographics and um, as you mentioned, all the, like, um, basically that is uh, repeating these uh, stereotypical views about like the, uh, the, the um, um, I don't know, third world countries where only like young people have access to social media and so on. But, um, that is probably a, a broader question related to um, also your theoretical work. That, um, that that is also not me that I'm asking that question. Basically, that is uh, uh, Alexander Galloway in his uh, um, uh, interface uh, effect that he also kind of tried to argue that uh, your uh, scholarship and your writing is uh, formalist in terms of that you are um, ignoring the. Uh, uh, whatever uh, other a 
aspect of, of, uh, of also we are talking about these Instagram images that the, uh, like I don't know, social, uh, also demographic, economic and uh, gender and race and uh, all the other questions, they are kind of um, not so relevant as these just formal features, at least in this exhibition. Like we are talking about hue and we are talking about saturation of the images. And uh, yeah. so uh, can you just yeah. comment a little bit about that? I'm, I'm not asking that. That is from uh, Alexander. No, I know. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, of course, you know, he was writing about like my my earlier work, but uh, yes. Well, I think uh, I think there are two. Uh, like, on, I'll give you honest answer, right? So the honest I mean, honest answer has two parts, right? So one part is you know I'm formalist, and what I mean by this is I'm interested in what makes art. art. I'm interested to study like art as a particular form of human expression and communication, which separates it from journalism, television, you know, uh, scientific reports, right, science data, and, you know, right, and uh, what separates, I think, you know, art and, let's say, what we call culture, is that it's not just the content, right, it's not just representation, but it's various aesthetic strategies, right, how materials organized, things like composition, rhythm, you know, color, uh, you know, balance, you know, right? And I think you know, it's not hard to say that these things are very important to human evolution. They're very important to human brain because we see them, right, in other cultures, right? The way we we're talking about music or dance, or, or the fact that other cultures kind of decorated were clothes. And when I say aesthetic, right, I don't just mean beautiful, not beautiful, which is like a modern kind of post-Kantian sense. I'm talking about a particular ways to organize your experiences, particular way to organize material information in such a way that it basically has some kind of bodily and cognitive effects, right? Um, so this is goes way beyond art. So the fact that uh, kind of people in the mostly in America but not only, but most in America, let's say in the last 50 years, uh, have people in academy, right, who study culture, uh, at least in some fields, decided to ignore this. Well, it's just a small episode, you know, small episode, right? Uh, so that's one answer, right? The second answer, I mean, different answer is to say, you know, if we're analyzing images using computers, you know, you know and if you want to say, what does this image represent? Is it Manhattan? Is it a skyline? Is it a landscape? Is it a uh, you know, pizza? It's much, much more difficult for computers to analyze content. But it's very easy for a computer, right, to extract things like brightness, color, texture, the so-called formal features, right, from all images. So, so far, you know, I've done many projects, uh, and also, right, this is part of a project and Nadaf originated of Instagram, this is what we've done so far, is kind of focusing with the visual characteristics which are very easy to extract. However, when we started this kind of cultural analytics research in 2007, from beginning I wanted, right, to also look at the content, and you know, people interested in content, I'll give them what they want, but as I said, it's much harder for computers to automatically figure out what the image represents. But now we're finally doing it, right? So we kind of have a computer scientist also working in our lab. And what we're doing right now is beginning to automatically analyze content of Instagram photographs we download, starting with faces and bodies. And, you know, ideally I would like to take all these Instagram photographs and have a computer automatically put them in different categories based on what these photographs represent. Okay, you know, here's like, it's like sushi shot from this angle. Here are two, 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 two girls between ages 18 and 25, you know, smiling to the camera. Here's the sunset. Unfortunately, you know, the computer can't do it yet, and I don't have resources of Google to do it, but we'll try to do what we can. So what I promise is what you'll see at the next iteration of the project is much more, kind of, much more, uh, an analysis which will much more seriously take the semantics, okay? Now, and then finally, maybe give you one last answer. So, uh, I think that this kind of like, kind of, you know, what, what, what people call formalist analysis, 
uh, and of course people who usually save it don't don't know that this was exactly the charge which was used by Stalin right and his critics to put tens of thousands of artists and humanities people into prisons and to kill them because we're not representing like working class and the ideas of revolution. So it's exactly very, very similar, right? <laughs> very similar, right? We're not talking about gender, class, and race. You're interested in aesthetics, okay? Like, you know, you're a formalist. <laughs> okay, so when, when uh, but Stalin, he just basically killed these people, right? <laughs> right? No, it's serious, right? I mean, you know, right? That was, anyway. Uh, well, so, so if I'm looking, I'm, I'm basically I was trained as a painter, right? And I'm very much interested in kind of modern art and how we go from Courbet to Van Gogh to Matisse to Malevich to Kandin, I mean, to like Pollock and so on. I'm very interested in how art became abstract and how these artists between 1850 and 1950, right, have kind of analyzed art and its elements and develop a whole new set of expressions based on colors, line orientation, shapes, and so on, right? So this analysis into the simple visual features, right, fits very well with period of art. But it wouldn't maybe feel, feel, it wouldn't work as well if I want to apply to Renaissance, if I want to apply to something else. So in my case, you can say my formalism actually makes sense because if you look at this period in history of art, I mean, like, you know, there's no content in Malevich, I'm sorry, just shapes. So it does make to look at, for example, shape properties, right? I mean, yes, you can also look about philosophy, you can also talk about religion, but it's also just shapes, right? So to that extent, I think there's a certain correspondence between the method and then with Instagram, I mean, we got certain results and we have a show, but obviously this is not a final result. Obviously this is only part of our answer. Okay. Uh, do we have questions? Um, any questions in the among audience? We take questions one or two. Midori, Yamamura. Paul from Muse. <laughs> so much. I think Lev answered brilliantly on the formalist. So if we, we don't have any questions, uh, it's after 8 o'clock, so we'll wrap it up and uh, let's give an applaud to the panelists. I, wa I want to thank you guys for coming. I know it's like not easy to get here, and it's a long way. And mo and also, I want to uh, I want us all to thank uh, Juan and Alice, who you know, I kind of spend lots of energy to put this together uh, because it's always more work to put a show when you can imagine. And Nadav and me just made a mess, just made these images. But when it's up to these girls to actually put the exhibition, and uh, thank you, you know, using somewhat limited resources we have here, but I think the result is beautiful, so thank you both so, so much. Thank you. This is great. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, okay. The end.